When one thinks of colonial America, their minds instantly go to the original 13 states of England's Yankee colony. Or they picture the Pilgrims, the Mayflower, or the first Thanksgiving celebration with local Native Americans. Although these images are connected with that early time, the facts are more sinister. Hello, I am author and paranormal investigator Donald Allen Kirch, and this is Stranger Than Fiction. Forget the world you know. Enter a bizarre dimension where the strange and unusual guide your imagination towards the unimaginable. Life is stranger than fiction in these true stories, where the ordinary is replaced with the extraordinary. Explore strange legends, weird myths, and odd folklore. The facts are laid before you to examine. You're invited to draw your own conclusions on these true stories of the paranormal. The New World brought to the old so many unlimited adventures, so much promise, treasures, and forbidden dangers. That they explored and conquered is without saying. Mistakes and crimes against humanity? No question. Tonight we will discuss one of the greatest mysteries ever to haunt the tombs of colonization. We will explore the mysteries behind the disappearance of the Roanoke colony. In 1585, 22 years before the establishment of the Jamestown colony, and 37 years before the Pilgrims landed in Massachusetts, Sir Walter Raleigh underwent a fantastic and yet untried adventure. The famous British explorer sought to colonize the New World. A favorite in the royal court of Queen Elizabeth I, Raleigh obtained a decree to send citizens of Great Britain to America. It was the intention of the Queen to gain an English presence upon the North American continent, hoping to profit from the raiding of Spanish treasure ships heading back to Europe from the Caribbean islands in South America. Sir Raleigh, it has been decided by us that you shall be given permission to take a foothold upon the New World. From that firmament, you shall promote the glory of the Royal Crown. If, along the way, you encounter any Spanish treasure ships as enemies of the crown, you are hereby armed with letters of marquee so that you may attack and seize such bounty. You are most generous, Your Majesty. I shall endeavor to glorify your grace. You do that. With such a simple aim, we started one of the greatest mysteries of exploration. Raleigh was never one to jump into something haphazardly, especially if it involved both his name and his personal fortune. Not that much was actually known about North America during this time, except that it was big and that it was there. The terms of his charter were clear. Raleigh was to go to the newly established territory known as Virginia and set up a presence there. He had 10 years to establish said presence, obtain an army of volunteers, and create a permanent colony subjugated by the British crown. If at the end of a decade he failed to accomplish this task, he would lose his charter and others would be given a chance at colonization. Being quite thorough, Raleigh dispatched an expeditionary force to seek out a good location for his colony, exploring the eastern coast of North America. The voyage proved fruitful and the site was chosen, the outer banks of what would later become the state of North Carolina. Contact was soon made with the natives, especially the Croatoan tribes of the Carolinas. As the fragmented records of the time had indicated, these tribes were quite friendly and accepting to the strange pale visitors. Other tribes in the surrounding areas were not. Most despised the newcomers and there were violent clashes between the two cultures.
following spring, an expeditionary force arrived with a squad of men, many of whom had just served military time, establishing British rule in Ireland. As a secondary mission, the men were ordered to explore the mineral content of their nearby lands for monetary gains. The commander of the colony was Sir Richard Grenville. He had orders from the Queen to establish the colony and return to England with news of their success. Does something ill you, Your Grace? The men have noticed a decline in your commanding spirit as of late. I long for home, dear sir. Amongst these savage lands there is no honor. God save the Queen, for sure. But we should have nothing further to do with this land called America. From the beginning, the colony had nothing but bad luck. <laughs> Most of the food and supplies were destroyed or water damaged when the lead ship accidentally ran into one of the many shoals lining the outer banks of the Carolinian coast. This caused most of the colonists to hunt and invade nearby native lands wearing out the already threadbare welcome. It did not take long for a misunderstanding to occur. That's it. Grab the bugger. Tie him up. He'll look all right proper for the captain, you will. What's it on, man? He's a thief, this one is. By all accounts, he is also king to these beasties. We are sailing hard water here, mate. After a few weeks, the soldiers assigned to the colony accused the tribal chief of a nearby village of stealing a silver cup from their commandant. Upon blame and the rising of tempers, the colonists soon attacked the natives, executing the chief by means of fire. Things were not looking up for the future of British law in the New World. Upon his return to Great Britain, Grenville left a man by the name of Ralph Lane and approximately 75 men behind as an establishment of a British presence upon the north end of Roanoke Island, promising a late return in April of 1586. Grenville and his ships disembarked from the colony on August 17, 1585. Their return was slow in coming. As April 1586 came and went, lookouts failed to spot the coveted return of the relief fleet. All hopes were lost, and most felt as if they had either been forgotten by the British Crown, or that Sir Grenville had perished on his return trip home. After a successful raid of a few Spanish treasure ships, the colony was visited by Sir Francis Drake, who upon discovering fellow members of his countrymen, offered to take them all back to Great Britain with him. Overjoyed at the prospect of going home, finally, and realizing that all had been potentially lost, Lane agreed to the venture. Less than one month after Drake's departure from the island, Sir Grenville's relief colony arrived, discovering that Roanoke had been abandoned. Wishing to still protect Raleigh's claim to Virginia, Grenville left behind a small garrison of men for establishment and to help maintain the colony. <laughs> the garrison was never heard from again. Of all the mysteries of Roanoke Island, this one is the most puzzling. When historians and seekers of truth tend to look for the lost colony, they always seem to forget this first set of settlers who had disappeared before them. No clue or theory has ever been attached to this particular island's original victims. In 1587, Raleigh dispatched the second and most famous colony to Roanoke. Led by John White, a personal friend and renowned artist, the new governor had previous experience having traveled with the first failed attempt to the island. What would later be called the Lost Colony of Roanoke landed on July 22, 1587. Unlike the first attempt, a happy event waited all those involved. On August 18, John White's daughter gave birth to the first English child born in the Americas, Virginia Dare. Most in the colony took this happy event as a good omen and encouraged Governor White to re-establish relationships 
with their neighboring Croatoans and natives that were savagely attacked by Ralph Lane a year previously. The Croatoans happily agreed and helped the colonists to survive. The other tribes violently refused, challenging the right of the Roanoke's ownership of their island. Although Roanoke made an ally with the Croatoans, they had trouble against the remaining tribes. It did not take long for their luck to start to change. Shortly after the establishment of the new colony, a man by the name of George Howell was murdered by neighboring natives while searching for crabs in a nearby bay. No one particularly knows why this crime was committed, but fearing the potential of more violence and realizing that they themselves had no military experience, all persuaded John White to return to England to request military personnel. When White started his trek back to England, he left behind 114 people, including his new granddaughter, Virginia. Given the lateness of the year, the voyage back to Great Britain was not only a foolhardy one, but almost next to impossible. Some good luck did manage to stay with Governor White, for although weather beaten and battered, their ships arrived. Barely. Plans for a relief voyage were suddenly put off by the ship's captain, who refused to set sail during the winter. White suffered through the winter, thinking only of his daughter and granddaughter's risk in the new world. Imagine the torture and agony he must have gone through. The next year would bring more disappointment for John White. Realizing the danger building within the mighty armada her southern neighbor was building, called into action all seaworthy vessels that Great Britain could afford. This included the fleet John White had chartered for his return to Roanoke. Your most glorious majesty, please, your people await our support in a savage and unmade land. It is only you who can save them. Foolish old man. England is at stake here. Spain and her king await to press his imperial heel upon our neck. Now, act like a man and stand with your queen, sir. White pleaded, stating that he had over a hundred British citizens relying upon him and his men to help them survive the savage lands. He tried to reach the queen's heart, hoping above all hope that she would listen. She didn't, and his vessels were seized. White tried again, hiring several smaller ships deemed unnecessary by the Royal Navy. However, fate was not on the side of the Roanoke government. The captains he hired were greedier than they were humane. Spotting several Spanish treasure ships along the way, they chose to attack and take prize of their cargo more than to help save starving and desperate people. In the end, the fleet captains lost all, gaining nothing, and White found himself returning back to Great Britain broke and defeated. Great Britain was now deep within a bloody war with Spain. It would take another three years before White would know the fate of those who had trusted him. Three long years of lobbying, pleading, and begging for him to set sail once more back to Roanoke Island. Queen Elizabeth had arranged finally for White to travel with a fleet of privateers heading towards the Caribbean. Upon their way back, the captains agreed to stop off at Royal. So, on Virginia Dare's third birthday, on August 19, 1590, John White returned. Not 
one person remained to tell the tale. His force could find no clue of what had happened to the over 90 men, 17 women, and 11 children left behind. Nor was there any sign of a struggle or a battle. The only clue was the word Croatoan carved on a nearby post and C-R-O carved on a nearby tree. Almost all of the houses built during the course of White's stay on the island were dismantled and removed neatly from the colony. This had to take some time and was not done in a haphazard manner. With the small exception of the fortified fence surrounding the humble township, everything was as the governor had left it. If there were a departure, it was not a hurried one. John White thought he had an answer. Before his original departure, John White had instructed those left in charge to carve a Maltese cross upon a nearby tree should they be attacked or have to vacate the colony. Since there were no crosses found, White assumed that attack had never entered the colonists' reason for abandonment. The word Croatoan could only be taken as a brief attempt to inform other British people that they had all moved to Croatoan Island to live with the friendly natives. White ordered his captains to set sail for the island in question. Before White could reach the island, however, bad luck returned. A terrible storm had arisen, causing the sea captains to sail their ships beyond the outer banks and out to sea. So much so, that after the storm's passing, they all refused to sail back in it. John White was forced, yet again, to stand only a grasp away from his answers, sailing back to Great Britain, a defeated and broke man. Never again would he be able to set sail. For the rest of his life, he was haunted with the questions. What happened to the lost colony of Rome? What happened to all those brave people? John White died, a cursed man, never being allowed to answer those questions. Theories are as numerous as there are questions. Here are the five most popular. One, the colonists were all killed by a sickness or some unknown disease. This is not a viable theory. At the time of John White's last visit, no bodies were ever discovered. If for some reason the Roanoke colony died out, none of the natives would have bothered with burials. Two, the colony was destroyed by a hurricane. Very unlikely. Hurricanes have been known to destroy island villages. But remember, John White discovered an intact fence surrounding the village. Although destructive, hurricanes have not been known to destroy villages, leaving their outer barriers intact. Three, the colonists simply left the Roanoke settlement, one of the more probable theories. After all, they had not heard back from White in over three years. Perhaps they all thought that he had perished at sea. Four, the Roanoke settlers decided to live amongst the friendly natives. Quite possible. Remember, the only friends these people had were the Croatoan tribes nearby. For what other reason? was the word Croatoan carved upon a nearby tree when discovered by John White. Five, the colony was killed off by hostile Native Americans. Most probably, the British settlers were not welcomed by most of the Native tribes. In fact, like most human communities, bad luck was always blamed on the newcomers. The colony was three years without a leader. Who knew what problems they faced alone? The natives would have had plenty of time to tear down the houses in the village and to do all kinds of damage to those who had survived. There are even a few ghost stories and legends which seem to add a little flavor to the mystery.
One centers on John White's granddaughter, Virginia Dare. As the native legend goes, Virginia had been promised to a favorite son of a nearby chief. She was known for her yellow hair and fair complexion. It was also said that Virginia's beauty was second to none amongst the women of the local tribes. She was a worthy wife for a native prince. Unknown to the chief's son, a local medicine woman, known for her powerful spells and healing of the sick, secretly loved the man. So, in her anger, she turned Virginia Dare into a deer. Alone on a hunt, the native prince knew nothing about his love's transformation and ignorantly killed Virginia with his own arrow. The fate of the medicine woman upon the prince's discovery is unknown, but to this day, near the island of Roanoke, Virginia Dare's ghost is reported walking through the thick woods. Sometimes she is seen as a beautiful woman, sometimes as a striking doe, blankly staring out at those she comes across. Often accompanied with these sightings, there is a crying within the winds belonging to those of her long lamenting prince. Virginia Dare herself is something of a cultural signifier. For most of the early years of the Republic, the story of the lost colony was overshadowed by stories of mystery. But the story of a white child growing up in primordial splendor among friendly Indians seemed to suit the romantic sensibilities of the latter 19th century. And so the icon of the blonde-haired Virginia Dare and her tragically beautiful death was born. While often cited as an Indian legend, the white doe seems to have its roots in English folklore. White deer are common in English legends and often used as symbols of Christian virtue. There is also the story of the Phantom Regiment, spotted many times along the beach of Roanoke, simply standing upon the shore, looking out for a British fleet, which never arrived. Those who try to signal or make contact with those lost souls discover that the specters simply vanish as they try to approach. Open campfires have been reported to forest rangers and policemen in the area around the unfortunate site. But when investigating, there is nothing but the silent vacuum of the night and more unanswered questions. On a more theoretical plane, the fate of the lost colony of Roanoke would remain a mystery until 1937. In September of that year, Lewis Cameron, a produce dealer, was hunting hickory nuts near Edington, North Carolina. He stumbled upon a stone with a strange inscription that he could not identify. He took the stone to Emory University where it was examined by history professor Dr. Hayward Pierce. Dr. Pierce identified the inscription as being Elizabethan English and determined that the stone was a written record of what had happened to the lost column. The stone reads, Ananias Dare and Virginia Dare went hence into heaven, 1591. Any Englishman show John White, governor of Virginia. Other stones were found with further inscriptions. One read, Father, soon after he went to England, we came here. Only misery and a war-torn year. About half our day for two years or more from sickness. We are four and twenty. Savage with the message of a ship was brought to us. In a small space of time, they became afraid of revenge by British and all ran away. We believe it was not you. Soon after the savages, fearing angry spirits, suddenly murdered all, save seven. My child, Ananias too, were slain with much misery. Buried all four miles east of this river on a small hill. Names are written there on a rock. Put this there also. Savage show this unto you, and hither we promise you will give great and plenty presents. Eleanor White Dare. Over the next four years, a total of 46 stones were found in a line between Edenton, North Carolina, to an area south of Atlanta, Georgia, along the Chattahoochee River. Most of the stones were found along riverbeds. Chowan River, near Edenton, North Carolina, Sadula River, near Greensville, South Carolina, and Chattahoochee River were three locations that yielded most of the carved stones, which would be named the Dare Stones. The stones would tell a story of a long journey, 500 miles, that would take nearly two years, during which the Roanoke settlers were forced to leave the island to escape hostile native tribes. Aided by friendly natives, 
the party escaped north on the Chowan River, where they encountered a hostile tribe who massacred over half the Roanoke settlers. The remaining settlers escaped the attack and traveled southwest toward modern-day Atlanta, Georgia. It would be on the first leg of the journey to the Salula River that Eleanor Dare lost her only daughter, Virginia, and her husband, Ananias. The party continued on the southwestern track, leaving stones along the way which gave accounts of different events and loss of life among the party and speaking of one native who had been sent back toward Roanoke to look for her father, Governor John White. Upon arrival to the Chattahoochee River, the trail ends with one stone that reads, Father, look up this river to a great savage lodge. We put many clues behind us. Father, the savages show much mercy. Eleanor Dare, 1591. Debate over the legitimacy of the stones began almost immediately after the appearance of the first stone. Dr. Haywood Pierce, the custodian of the stones, believed that the stones were very real, and through research and testing, he would prove their authenticity. Dr. Pierce interviewed every person who came forward with the stones and would do comparison testings of the stones with their inscriptions. He would travel to the location of the stones discovered, do as much forensic testing as was technologically available to him, and he spent a large portion of his time in the Edenton area searching for additional stones and clues. Dr. Pierce concluded that the stones were not a hoax perpetrated by a prankster or someone seeking money for the fines. As the stones were found in different places at different times by different people, none of which had any knowledge of Elizabethan English. He went on to surmise that these were written words of Eleanor Dare. However, he believed that they were carved for her by the carpenter of the Roanoke colony named Griffin Jones. Later, the forger did come forward to say that he was responsible for carving all the stones, disgraced and made a joke of in the local papers. The stones were later deposited into the basement of a local women's college. They remain there to this very day. Who knows what kind of mysteries still await those who are willing to try to find them. Perhaps we may never truly know what happened to all those unfortunate enough to land upon Roanoke Island in 1587. But one thing is quite certain. They should never be forgotten. If you would like to see my work, go to my website at donaldallenkirch.com. That's Donald Allen, A-L-L-E, Kirch, K-I-R-C-H.com. One word, donaldallenkirch.com. My books are available in both ebook and print format. They can be found on Amazon and barnesandnobles.com. It would be an honor to entertain you. So, for Stranger Than Fiction, this is Donald Allen Kirch wishing you unpleasant dreams. Good night.